Um, hello, my name's Nicola Davis, um, and I write lots of different sorts of books for children and young people, but nearly all my books are in some way about nature and the natural world. Um, so I'm just going to read you the beginning of one of my books. And actually, um, I've written lots of pitch books, and usually, nearly always, somebody else does the pictures for my picture books. But this book, um, which came out, oops, there we go, uh, which came out uh, last year, the end of last year, uh, I've done the picture before, so that was really exciting. And it's about a rhino, a rhino who starts off in the story in a zoo. And there he is. Now he thinks he's the last. So he says, I am the last. I've looked and looked and never found another one like me. And there he is with all the other animals around him, looking and looking. Uh, and I'll just read you one more little bit. Long ago, in the old world, there were others. There were big ones fighting and little ones playing. And there was Mama. Mama. And there he is with his mum. Um, and it's the story of what happens to him through his life uh, and how he actually ends up coming back to Africa. And um, it turns out that he wasn't the last after all. Uh, and it's based on the true story of a rhino um, who actually was the last of his kind. He was the last northern male white rhino and he was called Sudan. So when I was growing up, uh, I didn't have an ambition to be a writer. Uh, I had all sorts of other ambitions. I wanted to be a singer. Uh, I wanted to be an actress. I wanted to be, um, I think I quite wanted to be a wolf actually and just turn into a wolf and run off into the trees. Uh, but none of those things worked out. Um, and I ended up um, in fact doing a degree in zoology because the greatest love of my right the way from a very, very early age was animal. So I studied zoology at university and then I became a television presenter for the BBC Natural History Unit. Um, and I started to write. I started to write scripts. I started to write programmes. I wrote um, factual theories for BBC Children's. And that's how my that's how my writing began. It grew very, very slowly out of those very, very small steps. But writing and books and reading had always been really, really important to me. When I was a little girl, my dad used to read to me and he would also recite poems. I can remember sitting on the edge of the bath, a very little girl, watching him shave in the morning and him reciting poetry to me. And I think all of that, that love of words, that love of what words can do, that's what really made me into a writer. And I was a passionate reader when I was a kid. I was very solitary. I didn't really have very many friends. My brothers and sisters were much older than me. Um, and I read, books were my, were my companions. I read Lord of the Rings from cover to cover about, I don't know how many times. I read uh, a writer called Gerald Durrell, who had been an animal collector in uh, for zoos in the 1940s and 50s. And he wrote about his adventures uh, in the jungle. And I loved those books. And then he wrote a book about his childhood on a Greek island, growing up, being allowed to run wild and look at animals. And that was my idea of complete and utter bliss. I write lots of different things. I write poetry, I write picture books, um, I write short fiction, and I've just finished the longest novel I think I've ever written, over 100,000 words. Um, how do those different sorts of stories come about? 
Um, well, it's a very, it, it's not a conscious decision. It's not a decision that happens at the front of my mind. I don't think, ah, now that would fit nicely into a picture book or that needs a lot of space. Um, that's not the way it happens. Stories begin and everything I write is a story, even the nonfiction books that I write are stories because they have a story thread to hold them together. Um, everything begins in my heart. Um, and it usually begins with either a feeling or a picture in my head or a character who starts to speak to me. And it's nearly always immediately obvious whether that character is going to be part of a whole cast of characters and therefore going to need a lot of space and a lot of words, or whether that character is one person who has a very particular moment in their life to, to share with me. Um, some of the characters that, uh, that come to me that I, that, I, that I use in my stories are not entirely invented. Um, very often I do a lot of research for my stories and because they are rooted in the natural world, I often research real places, um, real conservation stories, real people. And they suggest characters to me. I've got uh, I've got a book called um, um, The Lion Who Stole My Arm. And that's about a little boy who is attacked by a lion and the lion takes his arm. And that's based on a true story of a child whose, uh, whose life I found out through the work of a photographer who was working in East Africa. So actually, there are stories in the world everywhere. There are little ends of stories sticking out. And all you have to do is look and then start to pull the thread. Uh, and the story will will kind of reveal itself to you. And sometimes it's a big, long, complicated thread connected to all sorts of other things. And sometimes it's just a little tiny bit and you pull it out and there it is, all done. And and all you need to do is, is retell it. All the books that I write, well, obviously they start in my head, but actually they all start in in notebooks, scruffy notebooks. Now, these ones I've got on my desk at the moment are unusual. They're very big um, uh, and they're big because in lockdown, I haven't been going anywhere, so I didn't need to carry them. But usually I have really small notebooks, notebooks that will fit in my pocket. Now they serve two purposes. First of all, if I see something, that sparks an idea, I write it down. I put it down in that notebook right there and then because you think you're going to remember and actually you don't. Even at your age, even when you're young and you've got a young flexible brain that remembers things really well, you won't remember some of your best ideas. So get them into a notebook while you think of them really, really quickly. The other thing is as I use my notebook as a tool to make me look. Um, and what I mean by that is I, I quite often draw in my notebooks, I sketch, so I look. Now that does two things. First of all, looking is a totally, totally, totally essential skill to being a writer. Looking at the world around you, paying attention, thinking about it, looking at what the world looks like, what it sounds like, what you feel about it and what you think about it are absolutely the essential starting point for any writing. But the function of drawing for me is also to get my brain into the place where ideas come. Now, the function of having a notebook and drawing in it as well as writing in it is really important to me um, because drawing helps to get my brain into the right sort of state for ideas to pop into it. Now, people often ask me, where do ideas come from? I don't know, they just come, don't they? Ideas just pop into your head like a little bubble. Um, but your brain has got to be in the right state 
to let those ideas grow. Now, I haven't got one of my drawing notebooks up here with me because I've just moved offices and it's all slightly chaotic. Um, but um, I do little drawings like this, like this little dog, friend of mine, um, friend of mine's dog. And just looking and making those drawings helps me to relax my brain so that the ideas come. Now, part of writing is finding or drawing or painting or making music, anything creative, is finding what works for your brain. Now, it might be different from what works for my brain. Drawing works for me. Jumping up and down on your bed and eating chocolate biscuits might work for you. I don't know. But it's your job as somebody who wants to write or draw or create in any way to find out what works for your brain. And once you've found it, do it. And if somebody tells you, don't do it like that, that's not the way to do it, don't listen, because everybody's brain is different. And your route into finding that place where the ideas come into your head is your route and your route alone. Some books, of course, require a lot of research. Now, books like Extreme Animals or a book I wrote about poo, uh, I've got one called Talk Talk, are all very much about real life animals, what they do, how they live, about the science. So all those books start with research, with me reading lots of things, finding out stuff I don't know, and generating a lot of questions. And actually questions are a really, really good place to start writing. If there's something you don't know about, write down what you don't know and then do some research to answer those questions. And what you'll find is that you start to have a piece of writing that has kind of got a shape to it. You've got all this information in a list and then you need to make your list readable and interesting. So you want to stick to the most exciting piece of information and then you need to think of how you're going to link between those pieces of information. Think of the, uh, think of the information, the research that you've done, like coloured beads. So you need to choose the most brightly coloured ones and then you need to have to, you need to find a thread that you can put all those beads on so they lead one from another, another to another to another. One of the things I do when I'm trying to find a way to string information together is I have a load of post-its and I put the information, one piece of information, one piece of post-it and I stick them up and then I change around the order until I've got an order that sort of leads me in a, in a thread between. And then what I have to do is make the word tell those people and link them together as interesting, as exciting, and as nice to read as possible. Lots of people ask me what my favourite book is of all the ones I've written, and I have written quite a lot. I think I've written more than 60. I've sort of lost count. Um, and all of them have a piece of my heart in. So it's hard to choose a favourite. But if I absolutely had to, it would be it would be this one, uh, The Promise. And the reason it's my favourite is because it speaks to so many people. I wrote it not just to talk about planting trees and how important that was, but also to send a message to children who are having a really difficult time. Now, I, I work when we're not in COVID times. I work with children all over the UK and all over the world. I meet lots of children. And sometimes I meet children who I know are having a rotten time in their childhood for all sorts of reasons. And I wanted to write a book that said to those children, things can change you can change, you will grow up, you won't always be a little kid at the mercy of your grown-ups. Um, and there is a future for you and there is hope. Um, and the promise, when I read it to classes of children, it is very often the children who are having a really rotten time 
who creep up to me afterwards and say, thank you, that book really helped me. That book was about me. Uh, and that's really what makes the promise so important to me and, uh, and so, so close to my heart. Um, and it takes exactly five minutes to read. So I'm going to read it to you and hope that my internet connection doesn't go down. Okay. And I will show you some of the pictures, but maybe not all. Um, when I was young, I lived in a city that was mean and hard and ugly. Its streets were dry as dust, cracked by heat and cold, and never blue gray. A gritty yellow wind blew hot. Me, scratching round like a hungry dog, and there's that gritty yellow dog blowing. Past. Nothing grew, everything was broken, and no one ever smiled. The people had grown as mean and hard and ugly as their city, and I was mean and hard and ugly too. I lived by speaking from those who had almost as little as I did. My heart was as shriveled as the dead trees in the park. Um, and it's been translated into many, many languages. Also, that's another thing I love about it, is I get these fantastic um, other language editions, you know, Korean and Japanese and Italian and French and uh, all of those. And now, rather wonderfully for me, because although I sound English, I'm actually Welsh, and my parents were both first language Welsh speakers. Um, it's just come out in, in, in Welsh. And although I don't speak, I'm determined to learn to read it and say it aloud because it sounds beautiful. Amazing translation by uh, Mererid Hopwood, who is the Welsh lawyer. And um, this is a book that's very, very close to my heart. Uh, a first book of the sea with fantastic, beautiful illustrations by Emily Sutton. Um, and the reason that it's close to my heart is that I really, really love the sea. And I have always really, really loved the sea. I now live, uh, I can see the sea out of my window now. I live in Pembrokeshire in West Wales. So I can go to the sea pretty much uh, whenever I want. And that is a great, great joy. But when I was a little girl, I totally lived for my summer holidays when we would come to Pembrokeshire usually, um, and I could just spend my whole day in the water, on the beach, poking around in rock pools, collecting pebbles, all of that. Um, and actually, um, one of the things that uh, I really love to do, and I still do, and I do it on the beach where um, I did it as a little girl, is collect pebbles and make little families of pebbles. And when I was tiny, I used to play a game with my mum that we called Pebble Cake Shop. So I would collect pebbles and I would stand behind a rock with my line of pebbles and these were my cakes and she had to come along with smaller pebbles and pay for them. Um, I played it with my own children. I I've played it with my nieces and nephews. Uh, and I kind of still play it in my head <laughs> when I go to this lovely beach, which is about six miles away from here. It's called Abermau. So uh, this is the poem that I wrote because of that. Pebbles. The pebble cake shop opens today. This square of sand is the counter. That tuft of seaweed marks the door. Our cakes are very special. Little bits of mountain, old volcano, ancient seabed. Some of them were baked before the dinosaurs were born. The sea has shaped them, rubbing and rolling, rolling and rubbing for a thousand, thousand years until they are small and cake-shaped, ready for today. Now, one of the things I never did as a child, because my parents um, didn't really like other people very much. <laughs> so we would go to the beach, and if there were two other people on it, they'd get in the car and drive somewhere else. 
Um, so we never went to places that had things like piers. I never went onto a pier at a beach until I was in my 30s. Um, but one of the things that Emily Sutton, um, who's the illustrator of First Book of the Sea, asked me to write about was a pier. Um, so I wrote a poem that was kind of about how I imagined a pier to be in the 1950s when my uh, when my brother and sister were growing up. So it's called On the Pier. And of course, because it's a pier, it had to be rhyming. I don't know why, it just sort of had to be rhyming. On the Pier. At last, the holidays are here and we go straight down to the pier. Mum buys a silly bright pink hat. Brother wins a fluffy cat. Sister tries to strike a pose. There's ice cream on the baby's nose. Auntie buys a bright balloon. The twins let go the string too soon. A seagull snatches granny's bun while grandpa's snoozing in the sun. Uncle's camera click, click, clicks. Dad says, who's for fish and chips? Um, so that was really, really good fun. And it's lovely when you work with an illustrator sometimes um, to to ask them what they would like to illustrate. I really like that collaboration so that you can um, you can you can give them something that they really, really love and writing for an illustrator writing for the style of illustration that they do and knowing that they'll enjoy doing it is a really, really lovely thing. Um, I did lots of research for this book and one of the things I found out about was the uh, the Japanese pearl divers, these women who would free dive without a scuba gear or even that a snorkel, who would dive down, 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 very, very, very deep uh, to find um, to find oysters that had pearls inside. I don't know if you know this, and um, the way pearls form is actually inside an oyster shell. A little bit of sand gets into the oyster and kind of itches the oyster. And to stop the itch, it covers it with mother of pearl, that lovely white pearly material that coats the inside of shells. And that's how you get pearls. That's how you get natural pearls. Um, so this poem is called Pearl Diver. Inside the diver's eye, the sea. Inside the sea, the tangled weed. Inside the weed, the oyster shell. Inside the oyster shell, the pearl. Inside the pearl, the diver's eye. So you go in full circle there. You start with the sea, the diver looking at the sea, and you end up with the diver holding the pearl and looking at the pearl and the pearl holding the reflection of the diver's eye. So that was really good fun to think about the sequence of images there. Um, and I'm going to read you one more, which is, um, which is one I wrote because it reminded me of, uh, it, I was thinking about something in my, in my life, in my twenties. I've spent quite a lot of time on board small boats. Um, studying whales of various sorts and when i was 19 20 21 i spent uh, a few summers in newfoundland and in labrador in canada following humpback whales on my friend's very small very wet uh, little sailboat uh, and very often we had to sail through very difficult weather and gales and we had to sail overnight um and arriving at a little port when you have sailed through the night, when this little, when you've been steering, this is in the days before sat nav, so you're steering by compass. So you'd be steering out on deck at two o'clock in the morning, freezing cold, gale, wind, darkness, and you're steering towards this little teeny light in the distance. And you keep steering and the light gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then by dawn, you arrive at a little port and you're safe, and you can anchor the boat and you can rest. And it's a truly, truly wonderful, wonderful feeling. Uh, and I kind of wish everybody could have that experience, uh, which is why I wrote this poem. It's called End of the Journey. Once in your life, at least, arrive by sea 
on a small boat close to the ocean's skin. Sail overnight, steer through the darkness, watch the stars, see the dawn creep in, smell the green of the land, and feel your heart fly up as the harbour's arms enclose you. And it really does feel like that. It feels like the harbour is giving you a hug. It's really a very, very special feeling. Um, one of my most recent books is this one. It's called Ride the Wind, and it has beautiful illustrations um, by Salvatore Rubino. And it began as a, a, as a non-fiction book. Um, I wanted to write about albatrosses. And I don't know if you know about albatrosses, but there are these very, very beautiful, big seabirds. We don't get them up in the, the Northern Hemisphere very much. They're really birds that like the very, very, very wild seas around the Antarctic. They have huge wings. They have wings that are 11, 12 feet wide wingspan. Um, and they spend their lives soaring over the ocean looking for fish and squid to pick up off the surface of the water. And they nest on very remote islands. There are lots of lovely things about them, including the fact that they mate for life. And my very favourite sort, the wandering albatross, is the biggest um, and most beautiful. And when they are courting their mate, they do this amazing dance. They stick their wings out, they stick their beaks up into the air, they wiggle about um, and they really kind of dance together, which is very beautiful and very romantic. Um, as I was researching uh, albatrosses, I also was finding out about the problems that they face in the wild. And one of the problems that they face is that they get accidentally caught um, on fishing lines and thousands and thousands of them are killed every year. Now, there are ways to stop this happening, um, but that means that fishermen have to know about the albatrosses. They have to care about the albatrosses and also they have to be in a position where they can change the way they fish. And for some very poor, small fishing outfits, maybe a little boat with just a, a dad and a son and an uncle working on it, that can be really hard. So I wanted to tell the story of the albatross and the problems that they face, but from the point of view of the fishermen. Uh, and that's what I've done with this book. So I'll just read you the first little bit and show you the picture. So here is the fishing boat. Here she is, the Magdalena. And on board the Magdalena are Dad and Uncle Felipe and little Saviour, this little boy here. There he is. There he is, who helps out on the boat. So this is the beginning of the story. The Magdalena pitched and rolled in the rough sea. Waves burst over her bow and flooded her decks with icy water. Saviour was exhausted, but he would not show it. Since his mother had died, his father, Tomas, was quick to call him weak and childish. Saviour would not give him the excuse. Seabirds crowded round the boat, gulls, petrels and albatrosses, all trying to snatch a meal from the fishing hooks. Sometimes they'd get themselves hooked. Xavier hoped none would be caught today. But what happens is that an albatross does get hooked and Xavier saves it. There he is with the albatross in his old playpen. Um, and the albatross reminds him of his mum. So really this is a story about a boy, a family grieving, grieving for their lost mother. Uh, and how the albatross and the story of returning her to the wild helps the whole family to heal. Um, and if you're thinking that Thomas, the dad, sounds a bit horrible, he's just really upset and he doesn't really get it about his son, but he gets it in the end. So it has, it has a kind of happy ending. Um, so I was, I'm really, really pleased with this book and really proud of it. And 
incredibly delighted with Salvatore Rubino's um, illustrations. It does what I really try and do with my work, which is to make connections between the big important stories in our human lives and how nature is important to us and how it helps us through some of the most difficult times in our own lives.